Welcome to the lecture on solving nonlinear equations. In this section, we're going to be talking about how you can use quadratic methods like factoring, completing the square, or the quadratic formula to solve rational equations, which would be equations with fractions in it, like this first example, cubic equations, and equations of the form ax to the 2n plus bx to the n plus c equals 0, or e to an even power, excuse me, x to an even power minus y to an even power equals 0. So in this first example here, we have a rational equation. And if you recall from when we talked about rational equations, the first thing that you want to do when you solve a rational equation is multiply through by a common denominator. So in this problem, our common denominator is going to have a 3, an x, a 2, and an x plus 1 in it. None of these are common factors. So to get the common denominator, you need to multiply them all together. So our common denominator is going to be 6x, x plus 1. So we're going to take the entire equation times 6x, parentheses, x plus 1. We're going to multiply that by the first fraction, by the middle fraction, and by the one on the right-hand side. So if we multiply by 6x, x plus 1 times this first fraction, the 3 goes into the 6 twice, the x cancels out, so what we have left is the 2, parentheses, x plus 1, and the 4. 2 times 4 is 8, and I'm just going to leave that x plus 1 in parentheses for now. In the middle, the 2 goes into the 6 three times, the x plus 1 cancels out, so we have our 3x times 1, or just 3x, left over. And on the right-hand side, there's no denominator to cancel anything out, so we're just going to have 1 times all of this stuff left over, so we're going to get 6x times x plus 1. So now we have a new equation that no longer has any denominators. We want to clean it up a little bit, so I'm going to distribute my 8 across and get 8x plus 8 minus 3x, equals 6x squared plus 6x. This is a quadratic equation because I see that x squared. And whenever you have a quadratic equation, it's always a good idea to get um, a 0 on one side of the equation. So on the left side, we have 8x minus 3x is 5x, just by combining like terms. And now let's work on getting that 0. So I'm going to subtract 5x to the right side, and I'm also going to subtract 8 to the right side. So we get 0 equals 6x squared plus x minus 8. Now you can try to factor this if you like. Um, there might be some combinations of 6 and 8 that don't work. If you don't want to try all the different possibilities using trial and error, you can always jump right to that quadratic formula. So that's what I'm going to do. So quadratic formula says that your solutions x are going to be minus b, and in this case my b is this plus 1 coefficient, so minus that is going to be a minus 1, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so 1 squared, minus 4 times a, which was 6, times c, which is that negative 8, all over 2 times a, 2 times 6. Now we're going to simplify so we get x equals negative 1. In the denominator, we have 12. And under that radical, we have 1 squared, which is 1. A minus and a minus become plus, And 4 times 6 times 8. We need to figure out what that is using our calculator. So we have 4 times 6 times 8 is 192. So we're going to get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 193 all over 12. And this 193 is not a perfect square. It's not divisible by any perfect squares. So we're actually done. Here are our two solutions for the value of x. Now the one thing to remember about rational equations is that you do want to make sure that none of your solutions are going to make the original denominators 0. The two values that would make these denominators 0 would be 0 for this x or negative 1 for this x plus 1. And we don't have 0 or negative 1 as our solutions. So these are both valid. Okay? So all we did was clear out our denominators. We ended up with a quadratic equation, so we used the quadratic formula. Right? So that was a rational equation. 
On the next example, we have a fourth degree polynomial, which normally we don't know how to solve, but this particular fourth degree fits the form that we have up here, where the leading power is twice the middle term power. So here, y to the fourth is twice this y to the squared power. If you have something of that form, most of the time you can make it factor or else you can use the quadratic formula on that as well. I think most of the examples that you would be expected to do, you'll get stuff that does factor. So for example, if I have this, I'm going to treat it as a trinomial, and that means I'm going to be able to factor it into two sets of parentheses. And what I need in the front position here is two things that multiply to y to the fourth. Keeping in mind what we want this middle term to be, we want it to have a y squared in the middle, then it makes sense that we're going to need to have y squared times y squared to get that y to the fourth. In the end positions here, we need two numbers that multiply to 16 and add to negative 8. Well, that could be a minus 4 and a minus 4. So just double checking, we get our y to the fourth. In the middle, we're going to get a minus 4y squared and another minus 4y squared, which is minus 8y squared, and negative 4 times negative 4 is 16. So we did factor it correctly. Now, are we done factoring? The answer here is no, because y squared minus 4, that's a difference of squares pattern. If you have a difference of squares, you can break it up further, and in this case, we would want y times y, a plus 2 and a minus 2. And this second factor is going to be exactly the same. So here is our completely factored polynomial. We can set each factor to 0. This factor is going to have a solution of negative 2. This factor is going to have a solution of positive 2. And these two will be the same. So we kind of have some repeated zeros here. So our two solutions for y are plus or minus 2. Okay, so whenever you have that the leading power is double the middle power, then usually you can try factoring to solve this, and we'll practice this some more a little bit later on. Okay, the next two examples here are not quadratics. We have a fourth degree and a third degree. So when we're doing these kinds of problems, my recommendation here is to factor as much as you possibly can first. And then, if you can't factor any further, then you're going to fall back on, for example, the quadratic formula. So, for example, on z to the fourth equals 81. To factor this, first thing we're going to want to do is subtract 81 to the left side so that we get a 0. You always want to have a 0 when you're factoring. Now, this does factor because it fits our pattern up here of being x to the even minus y to the even. In other words, these are both perfect squares. z to the fourth is something squared and 81 is 9 squared. So we can factor this as a difference of squares. So in the front position we need two things that multiply to z to the fourth, so that's going to be z squared and z squared. In the back we want the square root of 81 which is 9. One of these is going to be plus and one of these is going to be minus. By making the signs um, different by making them opposites, we end up with no middle term, which is exactly what we wanted to happen. Now, are we done factoring here? You want to double check that. z squared plus 9 does not factor any further because it's a sum of two squares. However, z squared minus 9 is a difference of two squares, so this factor will break down further into z plus 3 and z minus 3 that z squared plus 9 is just going to stay put since we can't factor it any further. Now we're ready to try and get our solutions because we've factored as much as we possibly can. These two linear factors are easy to solve. We know that this solution would be negative 3 when I set it to 0, and this solution would be positive 3 when I set it to 0. How about this one? Well, this one, we have to do a little bit of solving. Set it to 0, subtract 9, and because this factor does not have a middle term, we can use that shortcut square root property, which says once you get the z squared term isolated, you can undo the square root with a, uh, the square with the square root, and you're going to get z. But remember, you're always going to get a plus or a minus. You're going to get two solutions, and the square root of negative nine reduces. 
square root of 9 becomes 3, and because we have a negative under the square root, we're going to get a complex solution, a complex answer, and that negative 1 under the radical turns into an i. So in this section of notes, we are allowing complex numbers for solutions. So my final answer, we get plus or minus 3i for two of our solutions, and we get minus 3 and plus 3, or plus or minus 3, for our other two solutions. Since we're allowing complex numbers as our solutions, the number of solutions you get should match the degree of your original equation. So since this was degree 4, I should be getting four answers. Occasionally some of these answers may repeat, but you should always be getting four total factors. Okay, So let's try that on this example here. When I have a z cubed, I would want to get three solutions. Now sometimes I get students who see this and say, well can't we just take a cube root of both sides? So let me do that off to the side over here. Say that we did that. If we took a cube root of both sides, then cube root and cube cancel out and we get z, and the cube root of negative 125 is negative 5. We got one answer here. How many solutions are we supposed to be getting? We're supposed to be getting three. So somewhere we're missing our other two solutions. So that's why you don't want to do that. You want to try and always factor as much as you possibly can first to ensure that you're getting all the solutions that you're looking for. So before we factor, let's get a zero. So I'm going to add 125 over to the left side. How does this factor? What you want to recognize is, is this is something cubed plus something cubed. So this is a sum of two cubes. We do have a formula for that. When you're factoring two cubes, you get two factors. The first factor is the cube root of both of these. So the cube root of z cubed is z. The cube root of 125 is 5. And if we have plus in the middle, this factor is also going to have plus. The second factor actually has three terms in it. The first term is just this z squared. The last term is just the 5 squared, and that's always going to be positive, so plus 25. And the middle term is these two multiplied together. We're not doubling it, we're just multiplying them together. So we would get a 5z, and in order to ensure that we don't get any middle terms, because there aren't any in this original equation, we need to have alternate signs. So if this was a plus, then the middle term needs to be minus. Okay, so this is how you factor a sum of two cubes. The first factor here is a linear factor, so the solution to that is obvious. If we just set it to zero, we know we're going to get negative five. That's the same answer we would have gotten over here if we had just taken a cube root of both sides. But this factor over here is quadratic, so this is where we're going to get those other two answers that we were looking for. Now this doesn't factor any further, it never will when you're doing a sum or difference of two cubes. So the only way to solve this is to use that quadratic formula. So we're going to take minus b, which in this case the b is negative 5, so minus that becomes plus 5, plus or minus the square root of that same b squared, so negative 5 squared, minus 4, times a, a here is 1, times c, and c here is 25, all over 2 times a, which was 1. So we're going to get 5 plus or minus, the denominator is just a 2, under the radical, negative 5 squared is positive 25, 4 times 25 is 100, with a minus sign still in front, so this is going to be 5 plus or minus the square root of negative 75 over 2. And negative 75 is not considered a reduced radical. If we do a little scratch work over here, square root of 70, negative 75 is square root of negative 1, square root of 25, and square root of 3, since 25 times 3 is 75. The negative 1 becomes an i, since it's under the radical. The square root of 25 becomes a 5 and the square root of 3 stays put. I'm just going to rearrange this slightly so that my answer here becomes 5 plus or minus 5i root 3. I'm just putting the 5 in front of the i. So here are my other two solutions reduced. 
I can't cancel out any of these outside numbers because 2 doesn't go into 5, so we're just going to leave it like this. So our final answer, we got negative 5 from over here, and then our other two answers are these complex solutions, 5 plus or minus 5i root 3 all over 2. And these are actually called complex conjugate pairs, 1's plus and 1's minus, and those are called conjugates. So you're always going to have your complex solutions coming in conjugate pairs, a plus or a minus. So here are our three answers. Okay. So remember that when you have these higher powers, fourth degree, third degree, try to factor as much as you possibly can first, set each linear factor to zero, and any quadratic factors, you can either use that square root property or you can use the quadratic formula to finish solving. Okay, the next example is a little bit different. It looks like a quadratic equation. You have one option, which would be to FOIL this all out, distribute the 3 across, and clean this all up, and that will work. But what I wanted to show you with this example is an alternative way to do this problem. What I want to do is first start by subtracting this entire right-hand side over to the left side. And I'm not going to distribute that 2 yet. The reason I'm not is because I want to show you what we're going to end up with. I'm going to recopy this 3m plus 2 quantity squared. Then I'm going to squeeze in this minus 2 parentheses m plus 2 that we subtracted over. Then I'm going to put the minus 8. And since we moved all this over, we have a 0 now on the right-hand side. Now the reason I'm not distributing is because what's in these parentheses matches exactly what's in these parentheses. So what I'm going to do is what's called a change of variable. And what I'm going to do is basically create a new variable. Let's call it m. Um, excuse me, not m, because that's what we already have. Let's call it x and we're going to let x equal m plus 2. So we're going to let x represent all of this and all of this. So if we substitute in x instead of that m plus 2, then this equation becomes 3x squared minus 2x minus 8. So instead of having to FOIL all this stuff out and distribute and clean up terms, what we end up with with this change of variable is a nice quadratic equation, and this one actually will factor. So let's see if we can make it factor. We need two numbers that multiply to 3x squared, so 3x and x. Then I need two numbers that multiply to a negative 8 and are going to give me a combination that will give me a middle term of negative 2. So 8 is 2 times 4, or 4 times 2. Let's try the 4 here and the 2 here. That's going to give me a 4x for the inners and a 6x for the outers. And if I make the 6 minus, so put a negative in front of that 2, and the 4 plus, then negative 6x plus 4x will give me a minus 2 in the middle. So we did get it to factor. So once we have it factored, we can see what our solutions are going to be. This first linear factor, if I set it to 0, tells me that x equals negative 4 thirds. And this factor over here tells me that x is 2. Now we're not done. Our answers are not going to be negative 4 thirds and positive 2 because that's what x is. That's not what the original m was. So now what we have to do is go back to our change of variable and we're going to resubstitute back in. So x was negative 4 thirds. I'm going to put negative 4 thirds where that x is. And that means to find what m is, I have to set m plus 2 equal to negative 4 thirds and just subtract 2 over, and that will tell me what m is. So if we simplify here, getting a common denominator, negative 4 thirds stays put. Negative 2 is the same as negative 6 thirds, so negative 4 thirds plus negative 6 thirds means m must be negative 10 thirds. So we've converted this solution into m. Now let's do the same thing for x equals to 2. So I'm going to put 2 right here where this x is and figure out what m needs to be. So I'm just going to subtract 2. So that tells me that when x is 2, m must be 0. So my two solutions for m 
are negative 10 thirds and 0. So this is just an alternative to foiling out and combining like terms. It's called making a change of variable. And some, sometimes by recognizing that you do have like quantities here and doing that substitution, you can solve your quadratic pretty quickly by factoring in this case. And then it's not so hard to find out what the original m is. So this is just an alternative way of solving the problem. OK, the next two examples are similar. They have fractional powers, but what I want you to notice about the powers is that the leading power here is double the middle power. So doubling one third gives you two thirds. And over here, one half is going to be this one fourth doubled. So two times a fourth gives you a half. And why that's important is because remember from the beginning of our notes, that fits this style of problem, where your leading power of x has twice the power of the middle term. If you have this kind of power or situation, then you can usually always factor to make it work. So let's see how this is going to work with our fractional powers. So to make this work, we're going to try factoring. In the front position, we need two things that multiply to 3x to the 2 thirds. Well, we know how to get 3, 3 times 1. And the x is, use what this middle degree is to tell you what needs to go in these two positions. I need to have an x to the 1 third here and an x to the 1 third here. Otherwise, I'm not going to get an x to the 1 third for that middle term. And if you double check, x to the 1 third times x to the 1 third, when you multiply common bases, you're supposed to add their exponents. And 1 third plus 1 third does give you 2 thirds. So that's why this works. Okay? So now we know what goes in the front. Now we need to figure out what goes in the back. So we need two numbers that multiply to negative 24 and are going to give us um, a middle term of negative 1 when I factor in that 3. So there's lots of ways to get 24, 8s and 3s, 4s and 6s, 2s and 12s, 1s and 24s. That would be a long list to check. Let's see if we can kind of figure it out by some um, good guessing. If I let this be 8 and this be 3, then 3 times 3 gives me 9x to the 1 third, and 8 times 1x to the 1 third gives me 8 and 9 and 8 have a difference of 1. So if I make the 9 negative, which means this 3 needs to be minus, and the 8 plus, then I'll get a middle term of negative 1, which is what we were looking for. So we were able to factor. Okay, so let me clean this up a little bit. We get 3x to the 1 third plus 8 times x to the 1 third minus 3. Those are my two factors. Now to solve this, it's not quite so obvious what x needs to be, so you are going to have to do a little work here. We're going to set each factor to 0, and we're going to try and solve for x. We're not solving for x to the 1 third, we're solving for x. So on this first problem here, you want to isolate that x term as much as you can. So I'm going to subtract 8 to the right side, then I'm going to divide by 3, and we get x to the 1 third equals negative 8 thirds. Now that's the value of x to the 1 third. We don't want x to the 1 third, we want just x. So how do you undo a 1 third power? Remember that a 1 third power is like a cube root. So what's going to undo a cube root? A cube. So here what we want to do is raise both sides to the third power. Another way to think about it is if you just use the reciprocal power of what you're trying to get rid of and do that to both sides, you'll clear out your power. So 1 third times 3 gives me 1. That's why this left hand side is just going to be x to the first, or x. On the right hand side, negative 8 thirds cubed gives me 8 cubed, which is negative 512, and 3 cubed is 27. So one value of x here is negative 5, 12 over 27. Okay, let's do that again for the second one. Here we want to bring that 3 over to the right-hand side so we can isolate our x. And then to undo this 1 third or this cube root, we're going to cube both sides. 
So these powers cancel out, giving me just x, and 3 cubed is 27. So my two solutions are negative 512 over 27 and 27. Okay? All right, let's try that same process on this next example. The leading power is double the middle power. So we should hopefully be able to factor to make this work. So in the front position, we need two things that multiply to 3x to the 1 half. So I'm going to use 3 and 1 again. And the variable that I need is the same variable that I have for that middle term, which was x to the 1 fourth. And x to the 1 fourth times x to the 1 fourth does give me x to the 1 half when I add those powers together. In the second position, 1 times 1 is 1. Let's get our signs right. We need to get a plus 2, so I'm going to make this 1 over here positive so that 3 times 1 will give me a positive 3, and we'll make this 1 here negative, so we'll get plus 3 minus 1 gives me 2 in the middle. So we have it factored. Now we're going to set each factor to 0. And then we're going to do exactly what we did in the last example. We're going to isolate our x. So here I'm going to add 1 and then divide by 3. And this time we have a 1 fourth power, which is like a fourth root. So to undo a 1 fourth, we use the reciprocal power, which would just be 4. So we're going to raise both sides to the fourth. So x here is going to be 1 third to the fourth. 1 to the fourth stays 1. 3 to the fourth is 81. So there's one of my answers. For the second solution, we're going to subtract negative 1 to the other side. And to undo that 1 fourth power, we're going to raise both sides to the fourth. And that means these powers cancel out, giving me just x. And negative 1 to the fourth becomes positive 1. Okay. Now, when you have these solutions, you want to always check your answers, especially when you're dealing with square roots, which is what this one-half power is. We don't have so much of an issue when we have an odd power, like a, a cube root, like in the last example. There I didn't check my answers because we usually don't have any problems with cube roots because you're allowed to take a cube root of a positive or a negative. But when you have even powers, sometimes when you raise both sides to the fourth power like this, you create what are called extraneous solutions. So we always want to check our work. So if we check the value of 1, for example, we're going to plug in 1 back in for x. So 3 times 1 to the 1 half plus 2 times 1 to the 1 fourth minus 1. We're trying to see, is that equal to 0? Well, 1 to the 1 half is going to stay 1. 1 to the 1 fourth is going to stay 1. So this is 3 plus 2 minus 1. 3 plus 2 is 5. And 5 minus 1 does not equal 0. So in this problem, the 1 doesn't actually work. It's called an extraneous solution. We also would want to check this 1 over 81 answer, and that one's kind of messy, so you might want to use your calculator for it. So let me show you how you can do that. All we have to do is substitute in 1 over 81 for these x's. So we're going to do 3. Use parentheses here, so parentheses 1 divided by 81. And I'm raising that to the 1 half power. You want to use parentheses around that 1 half power. So there's my 3x to the 1 half. Then we're going to add to that 2 times parentheses 1 divided by 81 raised to the 1 fourth using parentheses around that 1 fourth. And then we want to subtract 1. And what we're trying to see is if this is going to equal 0. And it does. So that means this answer, 1 over 81, worked. So our only solution here is 1 over 81. So please try to remember to check your answers. You only really have to worry about that when you're working with even powers and even roots, like square roots or fourth roots. When you have odd roots, like cube roots, it's not going to be an issue. So it's just the even ones that you need to make sure of.
Okay, next example. One more like the last two, but what's different about this one is that we have negative exponents instead of fractional powers. However, the leading power here is twice the middle power. So we can still use that same process that we did in the last two examples of factoring and then setting each factor to zero. So let's try that here. We're going to set up our two sets of parentheses. In this first position, we need two things that multiply to y to the negative 2. Use that middle term as your guide as to what will work. So we need y to the minus 1 and y to the minus 1, and those do multiply to a y to the negative 2. In the second position, we need 7, so the only way to get 7 is 7 times 1. And if I want my middle term to be a minus 8, then I need to make both of these minus. So it does factor. Now we're going to set each factor to 0. So here all I have to do is add 7 to both sides. Now how do you undo a negative 1 power? Well, just like in the last two examples, use that reciprocal power. So the reciprocal of negative 1 is still negative 1. So we're going to raise both sides to the negative 1 power. Negative 1 times negative 1 becomes positive 1, so these kind of cancel out and give us just y to the first, or y. And 7 to the negative 1, what's another way to think of that? Remember, negative powers make reciprocals. So 7 to the negative 1 just means 1 seventh. Okay, so let's do that again over here. We're going to add 1 to the right hand side. To undo that negative 1 power, we use the reciprocal, and the reciprocal of negative 1 is still negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 makes this power go to positive 1, so we just get y. And 1 to the negative 1 is the reciprocal of 1, which stays 1. So our two solutions here are 1, 1 seventh. As an alternative, if you wanted to, you could solve this problem a different way. Because we have negative exponents, you could flip these over first and then deal with the problem that way. So y to the negative 2 flipped over becomes 1 over y squared. Then for the middle term, we have 8y to the negative 1. The 8 doesn't have an exponent on it, just the y does. So only the y gets flipped over, the 8 stays in the top and then we have plus 7 equals 0. So you could think of this original equation as a rational equation, and if you wanted to, you could solve this by just multiplying through by a common denominator, which in this problem would just be y squared. And if you multiply it by y squared, these y squareds cancel out, giving you 1. When I multiply the middle term by y squared, one of the y's cancel out, but I still have one left, so that's minus 8y. And then when I multiply the 7 by y squared, we get 7y squared, and 0 times anything stays 0. So you would end up with this equation right here. And then that's a quadratic. It has three terms, so we can try to factor it. 1 times 1 stays 1. 7y times y gives me y squared. And if I make these both minus, then I'll get a negative 8y in the middle. This factor has its, as, its, as its solution 1 seventh, and this factor has its as its solution 1. So those are the same two answers we got over here, just doing it in a different way. Okay? So here we factored first, then did reciprocals. Over here we did reciprocals and then factored. So either method is, is fine. Okay, we're going to finish off with a couple of word problems. This first one is what I call a working together problem. What we have is um, together, Scratchy and Freckles eat a 50 pound bag of dog food in 30 days. Scratchy by himself eats a 50 pound bag in two weeks less time than Freckles does by himself. How many days to the nearest whole day would a 50 pound bag of dog food last Freckles? So there's a lot of information in this problem. Because we have these two dogs kind of eating the dog food and also eating it together, I like to make a chart to kind of keep track of everything. So we have Scratchy, we have Freckles, and then we have them working together. 
In the first column, I'm going to write down the amount of time it takes them to eat the food um, by themselves. So how long did it take Scratchy to eat the whole 50-pound bag? We don't know that for sure, but we know that it's two weeks less time than Freckles does by himself. So we don't know how long it takes Freckles or Scratchy, but we know that Scratchy is two weeks less than Freckles. So if I call Freckles X, it takes him X days or X weeks to do this, then Scratchy is going to be two weeks less than that, so x minus two weeks. We know that it takes them together 30 days to eat up the whole 50 pound bag of dog food. So I do know this time, 30 days. Okay, so that's what I know so far. Because of my units here, this was 30 days, and up here this was x minus two weeks, we do have an issue with inconsistent units. You want to make sure that they're both the same kind of units, otherwise you're not going to get a correct solution. So which is easier, converting to weeks or converting to days? I think converting to days is. So instead of doing x minus 2 weeks, let's change this to x minus 14 days. And that way we are both using days and we're going to be consistent. Okay, so that's the first set of information we're told in the original problem. Now, in these working together problems, what you want to also do in a second column over here is create a fraction which represents the um, fraction of the bag that's eaten in just one day. So, for example, if it takes them 30 days to eat the whole bag, then in just one day, they will have eaten one thirtieth of the bag. So what goes in this second column here is just a fraction, one over however many days it takes them to eat it themselves. So Freckles can eat one over x of the bag in one day, and Scratchy can eat one over x minus 14. So we're just doing one over whatever number we see over in this first column. Now to get an equation out of all this, we know that Scratchy plus freckles can eat this fraction of the bag together. So Scratchy's fraction plus freckles fraction has to equal the total fraction of them together. So from this second column over here, we get the equation 1 over x minus 14 plus 1 over x has to equal 1 over 30. So what this problem comes down to is a rational equation which we want to solve. So to solve rational equations, remember that you're looking for a common denominator. All of these denominators are different, so our common denominator is 30x parentheses x minus 14, and we're going to multiply by that throughout the entire equation. So on the left here, in the middle, and on the right. So let's simplify. By doing this, by multiplying by the common denominator, we should be clearing out all of our denominators. So for the first fraction here, the x minus 14's cancel out. All we have left is this 30x times 1, so just 30x. In the middle, only the x cancels out, so I have 30 and x minus 14 in parentheses left over times this 1. And on the right side, the 30 cancels out, so all we have left is 1 times x parentheses x minus 14. So here's our new equation without any, parent, without any fractions, without any denominators. So now we want to get rid of the parentheses, so let's distribute. So we get 30x minus 30 times 14 is 420 x times x is x squared, x times 14 is 14x. This is a quadratic equation. So let's combine our like terms. And because it's quadratic, we want to get a 0 on one side so that we can see what to do with our problem. So I'm going to subtract 60x over to the right, and I'm going to add 420 over to the right. So we get 0 equals x squared 
minus 74x plus 420. Now this is a quadratic equation. It doesn't look too obvious how this is going to factor, so I usually, if I don't see right away how it might factor, then I just jump right into that quadratic formula. So that's what I'm going to do here. So x equals minus b, so the opposite of negative 74 becomes positive 74, plus or minus the square root of 74 squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So under that radical, we're going to get a mess. In the denominator, we just get 2. And we're going to need that calculator again. Let me move it over here. So what we want to do under this radical is 74 squared minus 4 times 1 times 420. So under the radical, we're going to get 3796. And because this is a word problem, we're not going to want to leave our answer in this form. It doesn't make sense to leave it in this form. We want to get numerical values or numerical approximations of this. So on your calculator, let's go ahead and figure out what the plus case is going to give us for a number and what the minus case is going to give us. So for the plus case, I'm going to use parentheses and I'm going to type in that numerator, 74 plus the square root of 3796. Close the parentheses for the square root, so these two right here. Then I need another parentheses to close off the numerator. And I want parentheses around the numerator because we want to take all of that and divide it by 2. So there's our plus case. To do the minus case, on a TI 83 or 84, there's a really nice, easy way to do that instead of having to retype all this in. If you look here where it says entry in blue, if you do second enter, what that does is it recalls your last command, that last entry that you typed in. And all I have to do is hit my left arrow and go back to that plus sign. Oops, I went too far and just change it to a subtraction. And that way I don't have to retype everything in. Hit enter, and that's your minus case. So my two decimals here are 67.8 and 6.2 if I round off a little bit. Now we got two answers. Do they both make sense for the problem? You always want to check that when you're doing word problems. So if we go back to the original problem up here in this chart, remember that x here was representing the number of days that it took freckles to eat this whole bag of dog food. So 67 or 68 days if we use this one, or possibly 6 days. Can 6 work as a solution? And the answer is no, because if I only took six days to eat the food for freckles, then scratchy is supposed to be two weeks less than that, and six minus 14 would be a negative amount of days. So 6.2 is not a valid solution, because it would give us a negative value for scratchy. So the only solution that works is 67.8. And if we look back at the original problem, it says how many days to the nearest whole day does it take freckles to eat this bag of dog food? Freckles was x, so we just need to make sure we round this off. And we can say that freckles will take 68 days to finish the bag of food. Okay, so there's our solution. All right, let's try one last word problem. This is another common type of word problem that you'll see. This is one of those distance rate time problems. Here we have Mark Keaton's workout consists of jogging for three miles and then riding his bike for five miles at a speed of four miles per hour faster than he jogs. If his total workout time is one hour, find his jogging speed and his biking speed. 
So there's quite a bit of information here. We've got some distances given to us, we have some rates given to us, and we have some talk about time as well. So when we're doing these distance rate time problems, remember we're using the formula that distance equals rate times time. And I like to organize all my information into a chart. I usually put my rates first, then my times, and then set that equal to my distance. And in this problem, we're going to have two rows and three columns. The first row is going to be the jogging part of Mike's work, Mark's workout. And the second row is going to be the biking part of Mark's workout. So we're told initially that Mark's workout consists of jogging for three miles. So three miles is a distance, and that's when he was jogging. So I'm going to put three in the distance column. And then he rides his bike for five miles. So he goes a distance of five miles biking. And he's jogging here for these three miles and riding his bike for five miles at a speed four miles per hour faster than he jogs. So he bikes four miles per hour faster than he jogs. We don't know how fast he's jogging or biking, so one of these rates is going to be x, and the other one is going to be something in terms of x. Which one is x? Well, since we're told that he bikes four miles per hour faster than he jogs, you want to let the jogging rate be x, so that four more than that is his biking speed. So x plus four. Now we're told for the times that his total workout time is one hour. So the time that he jogs plus the time that he bikes needs to add to one hour. So it's going to be from this column right here that we're going to get an equation. Unfortunately, we don't have any numbers to put in for these times. So how do we get times? Well, go back to your formula over here. If we want to know time, we could divide both sides here by rate, and time is always going to be your distance divided by your rate. So in our chart, the time spent jogging is going to be the distance jogged divided by the rate jogging. So 3 divided by x is his time spent jogging. Similarly for biking, his time spent biking is his distance 5 divided by his rate, x plus 4. So his time jogging was 3 over x. His time biking was 5 over x plus 4. And remember, his time jogging plus his time biking was supposed to equal 1 full hour. So this is how we get our equation. 3 over x plus 5 over x plus 4 has to equal 1. So that's what we want to solve. Now this is another rational equation. So to solve it, you want to look for that common denominator, which here is going to be this x times this x plus 4. And we're going to multiply by that on the first fraction, the middle fraction, and on the right-hand side. So on the first fraction, the x's cancel, and we have left our 3 and our parentheses x plus 4. In the middle fraction, the x plus 4's cancel out, and we have this 5 and this x left over, so 5x. And on the right, nothing cancels out, so we just have 1 times x parentheses x plus 4. So we have no more fractions. Let's distribute. So we get 3x plus 12 plus 5x equals x squared plus 4x. This is a quadratic equation. Combining like terms, we get 8x plus 12 on the left side. Because it's quadratic, we want to get a 0, so let's subtract our 8x and subtract our 12. So we get 0 equals x squared minus 4x minus 12. And we want to see if this could factor. It looks like it will. If I use parentheses here, x and x, 6 times 2 is 12. And if I make the 6 negative and the 2 positive, I'll get minus 4 in the middle. 
So we get lucky here, it does factor. If it didn't factor, then we would just have to use that quadratic formula. So our two solutions are 6 and negative 2. Now do they both make sense? Remember what x represented up here. x was the speed that we were jogging, that Mark was jogging. So can he have a negative jogging rate? No, so negative 2 is not a valid solution. So if x is 6, then he's jogging 6 miles per hour, and then he's biking 6 plus 4, or 10 miles per hour. And what we want to find for this problem was the jogging speed and the biking speed. So let's just write up our answer as a sentence. Mark jogs at 3, excuse me, 6, sorry, 6 miles per hour. I don't know where that 3 came from. 6 miles per hour, and he jogs, or excuse me, and he bikes at 10 miles per hour. So he jogs for 6 and bikes for 10. And there's our solution. Okay, so solving nonlinear equations using quadratic methods like factoring and the quadratic formula. That concludes our lecture on solving nonlinear equations. Good luck.